I'm ready. Okay. Five, four, three, two. Got scared for a second. I thought we were trapped in here. If his newest film, Poor Things, proves anything, it's that Yorgos Lanthimos is far from afraid of making changes. The movie shares many similarities with his prior films, however, it marks a distinct turn away from some of the stylistic choices he's made throughout his body of work. Poor Things both bears a certain resemblance to our own world, while simultaneously being unlike anything that exists in reality. And this absurdist observation of our own lived realities is something Lanthimos has been exploring since the very beginning. His films, while all certainly different, share common existential themes about human existence in our everyday lives. From familial relationships, to romantic ones. That was the first time I saw him. He was hiding behind a tree close to mine. From exploring dynamics of power. Oh my God, you actually think you have won? Haven't I? To the ambiguous nature of our notions of justice. I believe the most logical thing, no matter how harsh this may sound, is to kill a child. Because we can have another child. I still can and you can. We just find things we want to explore that reveal as much as we, as we can, you know, parts of human nature that we tend to shy away from. I think that's the attraction for me to be, you know, coming up with stories that, you know, put human beings to a test. His worlds, which at first seem absurd and fantastical, begin to feel more tangible as his films progress. You know, the thing is that these people are struggling with is loneliness and not being able to find someone and, and worrying about dying alone, essentially. Despite the high concept of the film and the world that it's set in, how real and immediate it is. The, the world of the film feels and looks uh, very much like, you know, the, the, the world we live in. It's, it's, it's a contemporary world. It's just that the rules are very different. These fictionalized stories confront us with the most extreme versions of the things we experience in our everyday lives. You should tell him to come round again. I will. He'd be great company for Bob. I thought next time I could take both of them out somewhere for a bike ride. I mean, at some point, you, you know, you buy into it. Um, that, and that's how cinema works. You know, you, if it works, you can buy into anything. Hello? This is so detached from reality, and yet there's just enough of human I'm fine, Martin. weakness, fear, jealousy, self-preservation, and, and ultimately pain, even if the characters aren't registering it as much, to, um, to do a number on you. By pushing things to the extreme, he provides audiences with enough distance to realize how absurd some of the things we consider normal are. People in this film, but in, in reality as well, follow completely absurd rules. It's like, that's how it's done and that's the way it is. And, you know, if you distance yourself from it, and I guess we're trying to have that distance by, you know, pushing things to extreme. When you distance yourself, you, you can realize how absurd some of the things that we consider normal are. And yet, Lanthimos' films are far from prescriptive, often featuring ambiguous endings that raise more questions than they answer. It is this unconventional approach that is mirrored in the way he structures his films. Early work on his film Dogtooth with writer and frequent collaborator Ephthemis Philippou saw them coming up with many scenes rather than the full story and then building a structure out of that. While the pair's second collaboration, Alps, followed a similar writing process, procuring funding for their third feature, The Lobster, meant coming up with a new approach. This time we, we needed to do like a treatment for what we were writing and a synopsis and all these kind of things to deliver them for funding. Uh, director statement, I, I'm never going to do. <laughs> so this time uh, we thought of the idea, we discussed the idea, and... Uh, we started writing a synopsis that would be interrupted by scenes. What blood type are you? B. So it's like uh, this Frankenstein document. So it's my, I think it's much more specific. I hope other people think so too, because we're not going to be getting any money. 
And a big part of getting to the truth of his films comes from placing a special emphasis on providing time for actors to rehearse. It is your body, Bella Baxter. You also to give freely. I generally charge 30 francs. Well, that seems low. I think the rehearsal process is so imperative to Yorgos's process with actors. I just encourage the actors to not overthink about their motives and what they're why they're doing certain things and how they're saying certain lines because I just find that that makes them much more self-conscious and then their intention becomes very obvious and I think that's not true in real life. His rehearsals focus more on physical games and movement, placing a particular emphasis on actors learning their lines in a physical rather than intellectual or self-conscious way. Just, you know, theater games. Uh, what are theater games? <laughs> <laughs> We acted like human noodles. Dancing. We would dance every morning. Singing. You're doing log rolls. Just theater games. Theater games. Games. I mean, there isn't a lot of analyzing and talking. He doesn't at all analyze or discuss. It's not literal at all. We didn't say the words as the characters with emotion. We rehearsed all of the lines, but not in the way that they would happen on the day. So it kind of allows them this freedom and they get to know the words from a very different perspective. His ultimate goal is to be surprised by the actors. Rather than feeling like they have their performances set in a particular way, rehearsals afford the freedom to be spontaneous. And this freedom of movement often extends beyond the performances themselves. Historically, Lanthimos has favored smaller sets with natural lighting and the freedom of mobility that that allows when setting up shots. That's one of the reasons that I don't like to uh, use like cinema lighting and I, I use natural light or practical lights and I don't want to have a lot of equipment around. I just want the camera and the actors. There are no lights, <laughs> which is great. So there's no kind of pulling down of walls and- Take it. The set is this hotel, the woods are the woods. If we need a light, we'll turn on a bedside light by the bed in the hotel room. So it's very, very high concept, very low tech, which is great for an actor because we're not waiting around for hours for, for the set to be lit, which is meaningless to people who don't act. They probably just think, so what? But it's just a very different way of working. If his stories feel unconventional, well, the way he covers shots certainly mirrors this. The idea of, you know, the shot of me and then the reverse shot of you, he'd be walking out the door, you know, he's like, no, I'm not having that. Everything about this process is, is, is unconventional. I mean, the, the coverage, you wouldn't even call it coverage, is, is unconventional. It's not like they do a wide and then a two shot and then an over the shoulder and then a tight. And, oh, that all goes out the window. Rarely will you find many shot reverse shots in Lanthimos' films. Instead, what we get are slow tracking shots, pans, and scenes filmed at extreme high or low angles. You will have to tell Harley you've changed your mind about the tax. With uh, Emma Stone, the first shot we took with her basically was the cameras on the floor looking up at her and she's making a cup of tea. And I remember we were like trying to get in the corner to get the camera right. And I'm trying to understand, you know, what they're what they're creating, you know, what story they're trying to tell through that shot, which is so much fun for me because I love that side of filmmaking. And this way of filmmaking can be seen as a gradual progression of his style. Abigail, hand me that cup. Do not. I'm sorry, I do not know what to do. Starting with his 2005 feature, Canetta, Lanthimos began building a cinematic language that informed his filmmaking process. It was quite liberating when I, when I made my first film, Canetta, which was exactly like that, where like five people, you know, 16 millimeter camera, no lights, no makeup, no hair, no nothing, just three actors. Um, and we started filming. And a lot of his earlier filmmaking choices came down to what he had available to him. While Dogtooth's minimal cast and locations allowed for a more formal style of shooting, his 2011 film Alps presented him with some practical challenges. With this film, we basically had nothing because we, did, we couldn't really choose locations or we couldn't really have props to make them up and... Uh, you know, it, it involved many more characters, many more locations. Also, having made Dogtooth, which uh, kind of looked more, you know, beautiful in a way and bright and colorful, I, I felt that this film should feel uh, dirtier and darker somehow. So when I met with the DOP, I said, OK, we have no lights. <laughs> we have this camera and these lenses. and." You know, we have to do what we're going to do with this. So we let everything really bare. 
So that's a, that was a major decision. In Lanthimos' 2015 film, The Lobster, he continued to build off some of the stylistic preferences he had begun to develop. We kept the camera either lower than the actor's eyes or higher than the actor's eyes, and we used uh, quite a few long lenses. Themios is really extraordinary at bouncing light and diffusing it and making sure it looks stunning. In fact, Yorgo said to me that he told the producers he didn't want any lights, they didn't believe him, so there was a truck of lights there for a week. However, this film also marked a number of firsts for him. It was his first film shot outside of Greece, his first English language film, his first film to include non-diegetic score, and his first collaboration with sound designer Johnny Byrne, a partnership that has continued on every film since. It's exactly what you think, just like you killed a member of my family, now you gotta kill a member of your family to balance things out, understand? The Killing of a Sacred Deer marked an evolution of Lanthimos and Burns' prior collaborative work on The Lobster. Here, Burns' sonic landscape goes a long way in setting the tone of the film, specifically in the way sound and music coalesce. The score is seamlessly melded with the film's abrasive soundscape, creating a sonic dissonance where we hear the dread long before any horrors are witnessed on screen. Did you come by the hospital today? No. Here, Johnny Byrne's sound design is almost the sonic equivalent of Lanthimos' slow push-ins, building undertones of an ease that only aid in underscoring the eerie atmosphere of the film. Do you know where you are right now? I'm at the hospital, the neurology department. However, the killing of a sacred deer not only marked an evolution in Lanthimos' use of sound design, but also in the way he was shooting his films. Where the lobster utilized more distant camera work on longer lenses, in The Killing of a Sacred Deer, you can see how Lanthimos has begun to experiment with wide-angle lenses, camera movement, and camera angles. For this film, he relied on a range of ultra-wide-angle lenses for super-wide shots, while longer focal-length lenses were used for scenes featuring super-intimate close-ups on facial features. Integrating camera movement into the film also contributed to the creepy nature of the imagery. This time around, it just had this um, feel that the camera should be almost like a, another presence, like an entity that followed all these people and, you know, was hovering above them or creeping from below and always be there watching them, observing them. So with that as a start, uh, we built this visual language of, you know, really high angles following people around or really low angles. There's not many shots that are uh, at the eye level of these people and the use of some very wide-angle lenses also help have that uh, feel uh, and a relatively claustrophobic feel as well, you know, like s small people in rooms that are, have been distorted by the wide-angle lenses. And indeed, these choices had a huge impact on the way he chose to shoot his next film. If The Killing of a Sacred Deer marked Lanthimos' triumphant return to 35mm film after a brief hiatus, the favorite signaled that it was here to stay. I've tried shooting films on digital, but I, I never had a, a pleasant experience doing that. You know, when you shoot on film, apart from the fact that I, I think it looks much better, um, is, you know, the discipline that it brings. You know, even the fact that you, you know, sometimes you hear the camera you know, running while you're doing the scene, it brings a, a different um, type of concentration uh, by everyone. The favorite was Lanthimos' first collaboration with screenwriter Tony McNamara and cinematographer Robbie Ryan. Even with these changes in crew, you can still see how the stylistic choices he'd been making in his prior work are still present in this you film. Must be safe. You must not be foolish and brave. Be smart and safe, I beg you. I will. After falling in love with wide-angle lenses on the killing of a sacred deer, Lanthimos decided to push that aesthetic even further on the favorite, opting for a 6mm fisheye lens to accurately reflect the film's themes. It's mainly uh, something that I've been experimenting with. I think my last few films, it's something that I enjoy. Uh, and in particular, this in this film, I thought that the use of wide-angle lenses in these huge spaces with these very few people in them, the juxtaposition of the lone figure in the huge space and how the space was even distorted, it felt quite claustrophobic. In general, it kind of reflected, you know, a lot of a lot of the dynamic in the film and the themes of the film. And again, you can see a pattern emerging. Robbie is an amazing DOP. He shoots things from angles that nobody else shoots, and it all looks beautiful. Yorgos is really brave with the way he filmed the, the lighting of it. 
He loved the light quality of the location and Rachel Weiss came on set. We're in one of the main halls and she goes, oh, this is very nice. And so how are you going to light this? And Jorgen says, it's lit. Like The Killing of a Sacred Deer, The Favourite also had an interesting way of melding music with sound. From footsteps to rabbit noises, crackling fireplaces to howling wind. You do not care. Mrs. Morley. Burns' sound design remains both truthful and period appropriate, but not without a creative twist. We tried really hard to make sure that in some cases you weren't really quite sure if you were hearing music or if you were hearing atmospheric sound that has been treated to come across slightly as music. This scene in particular demonstrates these complementary atmospherics. Listen to the way wind and fire work with the score. When listening to the sound design in isolation, you can hear how the effects are rhythmically sympathetic to the repeating geno of the strings in the song. You're still there. Yeah. Sound working together in this way ultimately functions to heighten the dramatic action on screen far more effectively than music alone. However, as the film progresses, it's Burns' modulation of these tones that's particularly interesting. Here, the sounds of wind and fire become much more overt in the mix. And with the increasingly darker mood, these atmospherics take on a new tone entirely. Wind that was once a light murmur is transformed into a tinny ring. And ultimately, it is this sound that completely overwhelms the mix in the final moments of the film a subtle transformation that tells us everything we need to know. But in his newest film, Lanthimos is approaching sound in a new way. Unlike the more realistic sound design of The Favourite, where the atmospheric sounds feel authentic to the environment. This is Bella. Hello, Bella. The heightened world of poor things required a sound design that still felt subtle, but simultaneously unusual. Oh, Bella. Out. As this was Lanthimos' first film to feature a dedicated score made specifically for the film by Jerskin Fendricks, it allowed sound designer Johnny Byrne to have much more fine-tuned control over the musicality of the mix. This saw the duo mapping out Bella's evolution, the varying locations, and the different time periods through music and sound. For Fendricks, this meant creating a score that accurately reflected Bella's perspective. You could argue a lot of it is from a first-person point of view. And of particular interest was the idea that something had been granted life that shouldn't have been. He was able to thematically represent this by taking instruments like pipe organs and bagpipes and bending their sound in a human vocal way. I was really interested in the dichotomy between wind that's made through a, uh, you know, from a person, uh, like a flute, breath, life, and then instruments, wind instruments that have breath made for them. By animating these sounds, he imbued the music with a peculiar quality that matched the film's tone. Sound designer Johnny Byrne was then able to seamlessly marry Fenderick's score to his unusual soundscape. This meant using the sound of a heartbeat to represent the chug of a ferry boat, hose pipes and large vases of bubbling water for the digestive sounds of Baxter's laboratory, and editing the reverb of a duck quack onto a dog bark. It was about finding ways of presenting soundscapes that, that were um, subtle but unusual enough to, to stand up against, you know, it, with so much other strong stuff happening, basically. We will need less of your tongue in the future, but overall most agreeable. Poor Things also saw Lanthimos re-teaming with writer Tony McNamara and DP Robbie Ryan, and this meant that he could continue to utilize some of the stylistic elements he had used on The Favourite, while also expanding in new ways. Again, Lanthimos decided to shoot his film on 35mm, but in a way that was different to his prior movies. Not only did he utilize color-negative film, but on this movie, he also used 35mm black and white, and ectochrome. It was after being inspired by Marcel Rebs' use of ectochrome on Euphoria that Lanthimos decided to take advantage of the stock's vibrant colors and contrasty blacks. And it was this that ultimately informed the overall color palette of the film. Incredible. <laughs> Who made this? We need more. Since its reintroduction in 2021, Poor Things marked the first feature to shoot on 35mm ectochrome and develop it using the E6 process. 
choosing to shoot these scenes on VistaVision further advanced these innovations. By orienting the four perf 35mm film negative horizontally in the camera, they were able to expose an eight perf frame, conveniently matching the film's 1.66 aspect ratio and yielding a more detailed negative. But both Ektachrome and VistaVision didn't come without their drawbacks. We only unfortunately got to use the VistaVision for um, a small part of the film because the one that we could find was very noisy camera and Yorgos doesn't really like ADR sound. So we only used it for a small section of the film. Due to the nature of Ektachrome being a slow stock, they were also only able to use it for less than 30% of the film. Unlike Lanthimos's other 35mm films, which often featured scenes that were under or overexposed and then push or pull processed at a lab, the Ektachrome film stock they chose for poor things needed proper exposure while shooting, and this required a lot of lights. <laughs> Better. Why I keep it in my mouth if it is revolting? This shifting from a preference for natural lighting was not only necessary for exposure, but also due to the film's reliance on sets. The scope of Four Things saw Lanthimos switching from mostly shooting on location to shooting on massive sets, which presented some practical challenges. Production designers James Price and Shona Heath were not only tasked with building large composite sets that immersed the cast and crew in locations ranging from London to Lisbon to Paris, but also marrying old film techniques with new. This saw them combining miniatures and painted backdrops with massive LED walls. And working on such large studio sets meant Lanthimos had to deviate from his preference for natural lighting. There was a lot of things to light, and I had not <laughs> done that before. So I, I went into a studio and I was like, oh my God, these sets are enormous. How, how do we kind of uh, get enough light? Even with these changes in Lanthimos' process, elements of his filmmaking style are still present. This scene in particular was one of the few they were able to shoot on location, and you can see how this change allowed Lanthimos to return to his preference for a more minimal lighting design. Yorgos doesn't really have lights on set. We had a lot of practical lights on the tables, kind of on the walls, sconces, and loads and loads of practical lights. We'd light everything so it's got a 360 capability of shooting anywhere you look at any moment where he decides to move the camera. That is totally coming from his way of filming. And one of the stylistic choices that he carried forward onto this film was his love of wide-angle lenses. After using wide lenses on the favorite, Lanthimos wanted to continue this approach on poor things, but again, take it a step further. This saw DP Robbie Ryan reaching for an ultra-wide Optex 4mm fisheye lens designed for shooting 16mm film. And it worked out perfect because it just created a full circle within the frame to create a kind of a porthole sort of feel so that you kind of, you're looking into another world. Ryan also relied on Rehouse Petsville lenses formerly used on film projectors to add softness to the image and lend an early photography feel to the film. For some reason in nature, they really bend bokeh. Like it looks so beautiful because it's kind of got this this crazy shallowness to it in a sort of sphere spherical way and we kind of decided to go with these as our like portrait lens and I, I love them and they're so beautiful especially in nature you know but perhaps one of the biggest changes was the extensive use of zooms and camera movement while certainly present in Lanthimos' prior work, ultimately his disdain for conventional coverage saw him putting zooms and camera movement to greater use in this film. Jorgis wanted to get something that was optically very, very impossible, unfortunately, but it was to try and get a lens that was something like a 12 millimeter lens that would zoom up to 150 millimeter. And we ended up finding a lens that was 16.5 to 110 millimeter zoom, which was made by Zeiss, and it's called a master zoom. And it's huge, it's a really big lump of glass. We ended up using that an awful lot because he wanted to try and do a lot of developing shots through a zoom. And the whole film, if you watch it, has an awful lot of zooms in it. And a big part of setting up scenes in this way, so Ryan operating most of the camera shots on a dolly and crane. It's always one camera. It's always on a dolly and track. So it's either static or it's moving a bit. Which lent itself to Lanthimos' preference for speedy setups as the track was something that could be quickly laid down inside the tight studio sets. You know, in poor things, there's a lot of movement or zooms as well that might be a little subtle within the, yeah. the whole construction. I'm seeing your style evolve with each film. I mean, like, you know, I know you've been working with Robbie Ryan for these last two films. For us, it's just like building a language, like a filmic language. So we just decide on these tools or these words or this language, like what lenses do we want to use? What kind of movement or do we want to use movement? But you're using zooms in, in the lobster and then uh, more playfully with Killing of a Sacred Deer. Um, true, yeah. and, and I noticed that in Killing of a Sacred Deer, all of a sudden you do have the camera that's 
like revolving around your characters and then it feels like that you go even deeper into that with the favorite and now here it just feels really muscular filmmaking like it doesn't feel in any way undisciplined but it does feel like an artist who's who's free do you want to see what the world is really like yes from canetta to the lobster to this film you can see how he's constantly striving to find new visual approaches whether that's experimenting with lenses camera movement framing sound or lighting and yet something about his visual aesthetic still feels so distinct to him see you in the morning Oh, and while Bob is in the hospital, you'll be responsible for watering the plants, okay? His movies have been described in many ways. Pretty unconventional. It's very elusive. Incredibly provocative. Very particular. Kind of extraordinary. Amazing. Wild. So bizarre. But his confidence to experiment and clear perspective gives them a tonal quality that feels so uniquely his own, however people choose to feel about them. I would never want to have, you know, people walk out of my films and saying, oh, okay, it was okay. I always think that it's important for a film to have strong reactions, even if it is positive or negative. 